Good evening and welcome to Bugaiski Hour. I'm happy again to be back in Tirana to examine important global, regional and local developments that affect the lives of all Albanians, both inside and outside Albania. I will be answering questions from our studio audience and also asking tough questions with an important political personality. Our guest today on the Bugaiski hot seat is Ettore Sequi, head of the European Union delegation to Albania. But first, I will give you my overview of America's perspective on the world. What is Washington thinking? My topic this evening is America's number one geopolitical enemy. President Barack Obama's private remarks to his Russian counterpart Dmitry Medvedev picked up by a live microphone at a conference in South Korea, unleashed a battle between the White House and Mitt Romney, the Republican contender for the American presidency. It opened up a long overdue debate on whether Russia remains America's number one geopolitical adversary. Obama asserted that he would have, quote, more flexibility, unquote, in dealing with controversial issues such as missile defense after the November elections, and that incoming President Vladimir Putin needs to give him, quote unquote, space. The remark set off alarm bells in Washington that Obama was planning to make major concessions on missile defense to placate the Kremlin and undermine US national security. Romney drew the ire of Medvedev following Obama's comments by stating that Russia remained America's, quote, number one geopolitical adversary, unquote. But is Romney right? In reality, both Obama and Romney are correct. Obama's Russia reset policy assumes that Moscow can be drawn into cooperative joint projects. This has proven useful in signing a new arms control agreement, gaining NATO access to Afghanistan, and placing limited UN sanctions on Iran. However, in the bigger picture, Romney is correct that a resurgent Russia challenges US interests in numerous domains. Russia's nuclear arsenal, its energy politics, its geopolitical position, its veto in the UN Security Council, and its creeping authoritarianism presents problems in numerous vital areas for Washington. Democratic representatives defend Obama by exaggerating Romney's comments on Russia as, quote, reckless and dangerous, unquote. A letter published by 18 senior advisors to Obama naively asks Romney, why did you call Russia our number one geopolitical foe? Evidently, the signatories are unaware of Russia's neo-imperial ambitions since Putin assumed power in the year 2000. They have not noticed how Russia has been inducing all of its former Soviet neighbors to re-enter Moscow's orbit through economic incentives, political pressures, and even military threats. And outside the post-Soviet neighborhood, Moscow uses Iran and any other anti-American regime to diminish US influence and raise its own stature in what the Kremlin perceives as a zero-sum geopolitical struggle. It is important for any American president to state strategic facts. Whatever the degree of cooperation with Russia in arms control or counterterrorism, the relationship remains fundamentally competitive and potentially conflictive. While the Democrats are right that one can work with Moscow in certain circumscribed areas, Romney is also correct that at present no single power is as well positioned as Russia to disrupt America's national interests in so many arenas.
It is time again for the Bugaiski hot seat. And our guest today, our special guest, is Ambassador Ettore Sequi, the head of the EU, the European Union delegation to Albania. Welcome to the show, Ambassador. Thank you very much for inviting me. Just a little background about you for our viewers. A uh, little bit of um, information I think would be useful. Ambassador Sequi had an illustrious career uh, in the Italian Foreign Service, which he joined in 1985. You look much younger, by the way. And in recent Thanks. years in the European Union Foreign Service. Among his most recent positions, he has served as, Al as Italy's Deputy Chief of Mission in Albania, as Ambassador to Afghanistan, uh, as the EU Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan, and most importantly, particularly for our audience, in January 2011, he was appointed the head of the European Union delegation to Albania, if I'm correct. Absolutely correct. Good. So <coughs> let's jump straight into the questions. I don't believe in long introductions. Uh, and what I think probably most interests our viewers, our audience. In a nutshell, how important is the European Union for Albania? What are the short and long-term benefits, as you would specify them, in terms of EU accession for a country like Albania? The integration uh, of Albania into, Euro into the European Union is very important for Albania. But it is very important for the country, for the region, and for every single Albanian. Uh, let me say that, uh, in general, the integration process in Albania and elsewhere is a process of transformation. Transformation to a society which uh, um, reinforces the rule of law, to a more prosperous society, mm -hmm into, I would say, a more modern society. What are the benefits? Several, a lot. Uh, in general, in the short term, the integration process offers to a country the possibility to address at a quicker ray, uh, pace those reforms which are needed in order to go uh, in the direction of the transformation I mentioned. Um, there is the possibility to uh, obtain uh, uh, European funds, for example. And I think th this question is very important because it gives me also the opportunity to, to say a couple of words about that. Um, every year, uh, Europe, the European Union, uh, uh, allocates more or less 85 million euros for Albania. Mm -hmm. uh, 85 million euros which go to uh, infrastructures, uh, technical assistance, uh, um, uh, to uh, segments uh, of the institutions which are critical, like justice, for example, like uh, 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 the um, support of parliament, and so on. We build roads. We, uh, we implement projects in the field of uh, environment. In the last uh, uh, 10 years we have spent uh, more than 100 million euros for environment. So these are the, the benefits in terms of uh, short term. In the longer term there is a possibility to attract uh, foreign direct investments because institutions uh, become stronger, become more credible. Now. Uh, in the long term, uh, all this uh, is translated in terms of uh, a better quality of life for Albanians, a better um, mm, institutions which function much better, more democracy, more freedom of expression, more, uh, I, I would say, uh, better protection of human rights. Basically, we promote uh, all those values which are at the foundation of uh, the European building. Mm -hmm. So, and what is more, more important, um, uh, all Albanians can see this in their daily life. Consumer protection, uh, better uh, quality of environment, and so on. So I think benefits are a lot. What about the costs of accession? In other words, how much work needs to be done? And would you say the costs of exclusion outweigh the costs of accession? Yes. <laughs> I thank you. This is a very important question. Um, I, I, I would reply this way. One of the costs of accession could be, for example, which in my view it is not a cost but rather a benefit, 
uh, shifting from a, a political approach, which sometimes might be seen in terms of zero-sum game, to a, so to say, a, a more positive uh, political approach in terms of addressing the problems of the country. Because at the end of the day, when we say that uh, integration it is a national objective, we mean also that. We mean that uh, it is about working together uh, towards a common goal. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes some of the reforms we request for the integration might be or might appear difficult, tough, painful sometimes. But uh, uh, if we consider the outcome, the results, I would say that uh, uh, the benefits are much, much uh, more important. Let's take, for example, simply the possibility for businessmen to <coughs> access a big market of 500 million people. It is clear that all these, these, the, this possibility to access that market goes through uh, rules, goes through a number of uh, um, uh, measures uh, which ensure benefits for consumers that mm -hmm. sometimes could not be immediately, um, so to say, popular for uh, the business. But nevertheless, the benefits are there and the benefits are evident. So my, my answer to your question would be there are costs, but the benefits are much, much more beyond, go beyond the costs. I understand. Let me follow up with, uh, with a question that I often is posed, well, let's put it this way, looking at it from America, it, it sometimes appears that the European Union does not have a singular policy towards Western Balkans, towards Albania, that national d divisions or national priorities uh, take precedence over some of the, uh, let's say, common European position towards particular countries. I mean, we see this, I think, in the case of Kosovo. Uh, where there have been non-recognitions uh, by certain members of the Union, five members of the Union. In Albania, I know it's a little bit different because I think there is one clear objective and all countries are on board. Yeah. But do you see any sort of national differences that somehow interfere with that sort of bigger EU project? Um, I would say, <clears throat> I would see your question from two different perspectives. Uh, Albania, uh, the broader picture. Um, one of our motto is united in diversity. So we recognize that diversity, uh, it is even a value, I would say, uh, because diversity means confronting and uh, uh, trying to, f uh, opinions, positions, and trying to, trying to find the synthesis of all these positions. Um, sometimes uh, we may appear, uh, as you said, uh, not consistent, but this is I think is not the reality. The reality is that uh, what is the basis of the European Foundation, which is dialogue, which is compromise, can be seen and, uh, in, in different instances, and it is a positive value. Because at the end of the day, what is more important is dialogue, exchange of uh, views, and then uh, uh, building on this, trying to find common position on the mm -hmm. issues which are different. We, we need to consider that we are 27, so sometimes it's difficult. Uh, but this gives me the possibility to address the issue of our presence, the EU presence in Albania. Uh, there is something very clear. We might have, or member states might have different uh, uh, opinions uh, on something, different perceptions based on their uh, individual history, based on their proximity or not to Albania, but something is sure. Uh, there is a unity of intent as far as the basics are concerned. And this is the most important thing because on the issue of uh, European integration of Albania, for example, we feel the same uh, and our position is clear. There's equal commitment by all EU members. There is equal commitment, mm -hmm. provided that a number of uh, uh, things are done mm -hmm. uh, by uh, Albania. And, uh, and uh, I, I, I see every day this unity of intent and this strong participation, this is really uh, this um, openness uh, uh, by all. Clearly, uh, we expect that uh, uh, kind of consistent approach by Albania will be taken in order to implement what uh, is the, so to say, the ticket for joining the club.
understand. Well, can you then outline for us the steps for our audience, the steps towards actual membership? Even for Americans, it's, it's confusing sometimes what, what hurdles one has to jump over, what gates one has to open, what, what uh, reforms one has to make. Could you sort of outline the stages and if possible, every Albanian is interested in how long will it take, mm. which of course is not possible to answer very simply. But if you could outline, uh, for example, how Croatia managed to get through all the hurdles, probably the best example of a country that's yeah. now coming into the European Union. Uh, <clears throat> I think that, uh, first of all, the example of uh, Croatia is a very eloquent example because for two reasons. First reason, it shows that the door is open, provided a number of things are done. And secondly, uh, the case of Croatia uh, also shows that when uh, uh, the integration is considered as a national priority, a national uh, task, uh, then it is possible. My Polish colleague used to say uh, that uh, uh, in the case, for example, of Poland, it was much more than that. It was a national obsession, which in fact uh, uh, allowed Poland to progress rather fast in, uh, in this path. So when um, uh, in 2009 Albania presented its application, then uh, it had to um, prepare to respond to a complex, very complex questionnaire because uh, the European Union wanted to know uh, where, what was the situation of Albania. It was a kind of X-ray. Uh, the process is very clear, rigorous and simple at the same time. Um, member states, so the council requests the commission to make a recommendation based on an assessment um, which is based uh, on the uh, questionnaire. Uh, in 2010 the commission uh, presented an opinion uh, not recommended, not recommending the uh, granting the candidate status based on a number of, um, of reasons which were then translated in uh, the famous 12 key priorities. Uh, once the conditions are met, then a negotiation uh, will start based on the so-called Copenhagen criteria, the political one, which is, means, in few words, uh, stability of institutions, uh, which uh, can uh, ensure uh, democracy, protection of human rights, uh, protection of minorities uh, on economic uh, criteria, which are, in a few words, uh, the uh, possibility to, um, so to say, uh, um, having a, a, a market economy which can confront the tensions of the market. And thirdly, uh, what is, I would say, an obvious concept, uh, the capacity to uh, implement what are the obligations related to the membership. Uh, when uh, the negotiations start, uh, then uh, uh, we discuss 35 chapters of what is called the acquis communautaire, that in a few words means <laughs> the, so to say, uh, the uh, complex uh, the body of common, legislative yes, uh, right. uh, uh, body on which uh, mm -hmm. the, the European Union is based. Uh, there are 35 chapters, so we negotiate and provisionally we close every single chapter, so we pass to the, the further chapter. At the end, uh, we close all the chapters and at that moment, by unanimity, a country can become member. So, the mm -hmm. second part of your question, mm -hmm. how long does it take? Well, there is not uh, clearly a receipt. It can take a longer or a shorter time. It depends very much on the commitment mm -hmm. of, on the uh, institutional framework, but really political will, it, it is, a critical, uh, is a critical requirement. But, but given the sort of arduous journey, do you fear not so much enlargement fatigue on the European Union side, but accession fatigue on the side of, of the Albanian population or the Albanian leadership. In other words, there's so much to do, yeah. 
how are we going to do it in this, in this period of time? And, and at the same time, we're looking at the elections, we're looking at, at, at the election timetable. Um, yes, this is, I think, uh, um, this is a very important question. Uh, first of all, we should consider that uh, more or less 90% uh, of the population of Albania, according to a number of polls, is very much pro-European. Uh, why? <coughs> I, I gave myself a number of explanations. First of all, uh, Albania is a country <clears throat> that has suffered a lot of isolation in a dark period of its history. So integration is uh, probably, there is a, even a, a, a stronger uh, need, a stronger uh, will of integration, precisely in view of those uh, dark uh, uh, years of the Albanian history. And I am also confident that uh, this 90% of Albanians understand how important, what are the benefits of which we were talking before, uh, benefits for themselves, for the country, and even for the region. Um, European side, I don't see, frankly, fatigue from our side. And I can offer a very eloquent and simple example at the same time. Uh, we are in a period of crisis, financial crisis. We could have said, sorry, uh, th those 85 million euros are needed to build a school uh, in a member country or to do other thing. It did not happen. We would have had a justification for that. Simply, we are committed will be committed also for the years to come. Uh, this, I think, is a very evident, very simple uh, demonstration of the fact that uh, there is no fatigue. Clearly, what is important from our perspective is that these funds are properly used and uh, because we want to see results. When we speak in terms of implementation, implementation means many different things included a good use and an effective use for the purposes of uh, the integration of uh, Albania into Europe of those funds. We will break briefly for, for some adverts and be back with Ambassador Sequi in a moment. Well, let me ask you a little bit more specifically. As, as you've mentioned, Tirana does need to do a great deal of work still to gain candidate status. Uh, and in particular, has to meet these 12 recommendations or 12 stipulations, conditions, whatever you yeah. call them, set by the European Commission. Could you sort of outline what progress has been made thus far in these areas uh, since these stipulations, these recommendations were issued? Which have been the successes and where do you think more work needs to be done? <laughs> to, to put it diplomatically, maybe. <laughs> well, let me start from the end. <clears throat> Every year in October, we issue a document, which is uh, uh, the X-ray of the situation, the MRI, rather, um, <clears throat> the progress report, in which we say, OK, progress has been made in this, this, and that. And there was no progress in this other area, or limited one. Now, in this progress report, based on the progress and the results achieved, uh, we recommend or not granting candidate status. So uh, we are in general uh, reluctant to make uh, midterm assessments. And, uh, we prefer, but I would like uh, um, to offer um, a, few, a few remarks mm -hmm. on um, <coughs> your question. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to stress that from November last year till now, I saw, this is evident to everybody, uh, some progress in terms of uh, uh, political will to progress in the right direction. If you consider, for example, from November till now, we had um, the approval of a number of laws requiring three-fifth majority, which is one of the key priorities. Mm -hmm. We had uh, uh, the creation of a um, ad hoc committee, parliamentary committee, to address another recommendation, which is the electoral reform, according to the uh, OSC or the recommendations. 
we had the creation of a working group on uh, uh, the functioning uh, of the parliament, or the rules of procedures of the parliament, parliamentary, uh, there, there, is a, there is a key priority relay, which relates to the parliament. We had the appointment of the ombudsman through a process which was uh, transparent, was effective, and uh, which ended with a landslide vote uh, in the past, 127 votes, which was a very meaningful, I think, uh, uh, indication of the fact that there is a common goodwill. Um, there are uh, other um, progress in, in, in other fields. Now, what is important is to sustain all this. Clearly, we would like very much to see uh, progress in particular, in some recommendations, in some of the key priorities. Uh, not only those, but for example, let's take uh, the issue of uh, property rights, which is a very serious problem. Property rights, for example, is uh, uh, a problem which involves many different aspects, including, for example, attraction of foreign investments. Uh, we would like to see progress in the uh, fight against corruption. We are detecting some moves also um, there. Mm, recently, uh, there was, I would say, a common positive stand in uh, um, wavering the immunity for judges and uh, other key positions, which I think is a good um, progress in the right direction. Now, of course, we need to implement this goodwill. Mm. Uh, we would like to see uh, a better judiciary because at the end of the day, rule of law is at the foundation of also the Copenhagen criteria. So there are a number of uh, progress that we would like to see. Uh, I'm neither optimistic nor pessimistic. I'm simply realistic and I, my realism uh, suggests me that uh, uh, those progresses are achievable, but they require common commitment, strong determination and solid resolve. In October we shall see if all those uh, elements were there. And presumably this is a commitment of the entire political elite, not just a particular government, because there has to be continuity. <clears throat> when uh, we speak of uh, uh, integration as a national priority, we mean, and a national objective, all the countries should move in that direction. And let me say, it's not only about the government, it's not only about the political class, it is about media, it is about civil society. For us, the role of civil society is crucial. It is about every single Albania who is um, committed to those uh, values and those rules, which are the core of the European uh, uh, Foundation. I understand. How would you respond to those, and I've heard not many people, but some have made a comment that these, these recommendations are really an imposition that this is an outside power trying to impose certain standards, telling Albania what to do. How would you respond to that? The basic comment maybe from the street. Uh, I would respond uh, in two ways. First of all, uh, it is probably necessary also from our side to explain much better what we are talking about. And this is something that uh, uh, we need to do it fastly. Secondly, well, uh, I suggested before when I spoke about all the procedures which uh, will lead to the uh, membership. Albania has presented an application. Uh, so I assume that this is, is because Albania wants to become Join a member. Right. <laughs> and if this is the case, then there is a number of actions which should be undertaken and results which needs to be achieved. Um, it is obvious that uh, the, from my perspective, uh, the integration of Albania and of the region into the Union uh, is a good thing, is an interest. But we should also say that there is no imposition. Mm -hmm. In fact, this is, and I want to stress it, uh, this is a merit-based process. Those who progress progress because of their merit, because of their commitment, because they do things 
Mm -hmm. well, without going into specifics, as you said, it's midterm. You can't fully assess the progress that has been made in these specific areas. But maybe in gen more general terms, if you could tell us why it's important to, to follow some of these ideas, to follow some of these, uh, let's say, standards, European standards, particularly uh, political consensus, uh, ability of parliament to work, uh, anti-corruption, why are these so important for Albania to live up to those to, the, to, to higher standards than it has now? Let's put it that way. As I said before, the progress uh, towards Europe is a process of transformation. And clearly, the transformation towards those values which are uh, the same values for all the members of the club. Uh, therefore, it is necessary if the club is uh, uh, wants to be joined then uh, to, to to do precisely those things which are necessary uh, i refer to the uh, copenhagen criteria which are the the compass the the uh, the star to be followed in that direction i think the but citizens I, of albania need to know more i don't think there's that much knowledge about what these criteria this is, are uh, this is <coughs> this is precisely why mm -hmm. I, I said that uh, we need really to engage ourselves much much more mm -hmm. also media mm -hmm. have a very important role in that we have to present in a friendly way w what we are talking about and I, uh, I i wish to thank you very warmly for this opportunity that you are giving me uh, but there is another aspect in the end doing all this uh, better parliament, a parliament which functions in a more effective way, uh, better rule of law, uh, better political environment and climate, so to say. This is, in, at the end of the day, in the interest of all Albanians. Uh, uh, if I have to explain in one sentence what European integration is it about, I would say one thing, very simple, which is, it is about ensuring that the country works in a better way. And this obviously is in the interest of all the citizens. Uh, let's take a couple of very simple examples. Uh, procurement. Now, we are paying for a project in the field of e-procurement because uh, we want to make all the procurement process, which is basic for, it is extremely important for all the private sector, for example, not only for the private sector, but also for foreign investors, more, so to say, um, simple, more transparent. Uh, we say, we have a slogan that a, a computer does not take bribe. Okay, we want precisely to to facilitate, to simplify the life of uh, people dealing with uh, uh, procurement. Let's take uh, uh, export. Accessing a market which is a big market, 500 million people, is a great opportunity. But then you have to, to have the right labels on the, the beer in order to export beer or the sardines or fruit, you have to have uh, uh, specific checks on the uh, exports that you... So, <clears throat> in the end, this is a big opportunity, again, in uh, political terms, economic terms, and I would say, broadly speaking, a, bro a big opportunity for the society as a whole. Well, you, you mentioned that there needs to be more outreach by the European yeah. Union particularly in Albania. Could you sort of outline for us the program? Uh, May has been designated the EU month or EU outreach month to Albania. You even have a poster, <coughs> I think, that you showed me earlier. Yeah. Uh, could you sort of specifically tell us what is planned, um, which parts of the country, who is likely to be involved, and what do you expect the results to be? This is, uh, this is the, <coughs> the poster of this European month, which is uh, organized uh, in uh, cooperation with uh, all the embassies of member states in uh, Tirana, which proves that there is <laughs> a commitment by all. There is no fatigue, but on the opposite, we want really to... And coordination. <laughs> and coordination, and this is absolutely... Um, uh, it is not only about one month, but it is about something more, um, so to say, uh, I wouldn't say intrusive, but um, more sustained. 
and sustainable. We have, for example, uh, web chat, we have uh, 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 cinema uh, exhibit, we have a concert, we have uh, um, uh, initiative on the promotion of the cultural heritage of uh, Albania, also in order to find also what are the European roots mm -hmm. of uh, Albanian culture. We have uh, uh, cycling events, uh, we have uh, 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 photo exhibits uh, of those Albanians who live abroad and are already integrated so they can offer an immediate, uh, uh, if not a model, but an example of integration which is already there. We have uh, competitions among schools about uh, with quiz and about for example the uh, European basic information because we want really to, 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 to try to make an outreach in the schools but this is not uh, enough we have for example round table for investors um, this is not enough uh, we are planning to, to organize many other things for example I'm planning to launch um, an initiative which is a kind of soap opera uh, explaining in a very plain friendly and uh, captivating way hopefully uh, what is integration what are the benefits for the daily life of an Alb average Albanian family mm -hmm. of integration uh, we are going to organize a number of lectures in the uh, universities. We are in a few days we shall be sending a group of Albanian journalists to Brussels for a study course because we want <coughs> to explain uh, more directly in a non, let me use this word, in a non-theological way uh, what concretely uh, the Union does and how and why and what could be the impact um, for Albania. We are planning, for example, uh, in the next couple of months to have a big conference on uh, uh, media freedom. So there is a wide range of initiatives which are addressed to different, all the different segments of the Albanian society. Basically, my challenge, my personal challenge is to be in a position to explain to the average Albanian, uh, my gardener or the uh, old lady, I don't know, in Leisure or Skodra, uh, to answer one question. Okay, you're talking about integration, but what can I get from that? Mm -hmm. So, this is my ambition. Conversely, do you think the European Union needs more and better information about Albania? In other words, is Albania selling itself short in the European Union in terms of, as you said, its European roots, its history, yeah. its contribution to European culture? even to the defense of Europe, one would say, uh, under Skenderbeg. H how, would you, how would you describe that process? Is uh, yes, uh, this is, uh, <coughs> you're right. Uh, there is an issue about marketing. But I think that the best marketing now would be to offer uh, the, not only the perception, but to show that Albania as a whole the political class and all the segments are progressing sincerely, are uh, committed in this, uh, in this path. I think that this would be by far the best possible uh, publicity. Mm -hmm. So but this, this May uh, EU month is not confined to, to one month, what you're saying? This uh, May, several... May it is, a, it is a very special month because mm -hmm. in May, on uh, May 9th, we celebrate uh, uh, Europe's day. Mm -hmm. So May has a particular meaning for us right. but again uh, this is not limited to May. Mm -hmm. It is uh, a process uh, of outreach which should continue after May and, mm -hmm. and uh, for the future. Right. Well let me ask you a question about conditionality. Um, how would you respond to the observation that without conditionality towards an aspirant the EU loses its influence? And I've heard it expressed by some that following the visa liberalization that the, EU, um, that the EU launched, that it's lost a lot of leverage in a way with Tirana. Uh, that's the first part of my question. Secondly, two East Balkan countries, if you remember, came in in 2007. 
and both have come, Bulgaria and Romania, both have come under a lot of criticism since then that the reform process was incomplete, particularly in judicial reform, uh, combating corruption, organized crime, and so on and so forth. Presumably, Brussels needs really to guarantee more than before that Albania fully implements all these EU criteria before it becomes a member, rather than trying to press it to fulfill the criteria after it becomes a member. Uh, <clears throat> on the first question, uh, yes, uh, there is the perception, there was a perception that uh, after visa liberalization, uh, there was a, um, in a way, the leverage was a little bit reduced. I, I think this is physiological, uh, uh, but I don't agree. Uh, I don't agree for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, visa liberalization is the first step in a trip which is uh, very long. And um, if I have to judge based on the experience of last year, uh, I detected an increasing awareness of the fact that visa is a segment of this long trip. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, in order to address this issue, again, it is necessary to um, make sure that the outreach is successful and is effective. Because all the benefits we are talking about, and uh, again, I'm very grateful for that question, uh, exceed by far the pure uh, visa liberalization. Because basically, uh, we are talking about improving uh, broadly speaking, the life of uh, people and increasing the good functioning of a whole society. So this is much, much more important than having purely... Than simply being able to leave the country and come back. <laughs> but uh, uh, visa liberalization does not mean, for example, uh, mm -hmm. freedom of movement, mm -hmm. because they are two different things, and freedom of movement is probably more important than purely visa liberalization and so on. So, yeah. But we need really to explain much better all this. And in itself, the progress towards Europe is based on a number of benchmarks that should be implemented. Let's, um, I, I talked uh, before about the uh, 35 chapters uh, of the European acquis benchmarks. I talked about the Copenhagen criteria are the benchmarks, they are there. And uh, let's not forget that uh, in a way, uh, also after becoming member of the European Union, the story is not over because uh, 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 some pieces of legislation, European legislation prevail over the uh, uh, national legislation. The commission, which is in a way the guardian of that legislation, has also the possibility to uh, go uh, before the uh, uh, European Court in order to make sure that, for example, in case of breach, a country which is already member is fined. So uh, it is such a pervasive uh, uh, process that involves also member states, those who are already members of the club, that I think uh, uh, once you start the, the, the trip this trip has no return. But do you think some lessons have been learned oh, from uh, the... But I failed to answer the other question. I was going to re-ask it in case <laughs> you forgot, <but> please. <laughs> um, in general, uh, I would say that uh, in the integration process is also a process which is based on lessons learned. Mm -hmm. And it is clear that, for example, we request the uh, Albanian um, uh, integration process to be based uh, in particular on issues related to rule of law, fight against corruption, better functioning judiciary, mm -hmm. and so on. These are priorities for us because these are priorities for joining the club. Um, I would say also that uh, uh, as far as I see, this is understood. Today I had a meeting with the Minister of, um, of Interior, and I consult rather often the Minister of Justice because we have uh, very big programs of assistance to both ministries. 
and um, I am rather confident that there is full awareness of the fact that the progress of Albania in the right direction is very closely linked to the fight against corruption, mm -hmm. rule of law, judiciary. And not only that, we need to see implementation. Because we are not, uh, uh, we don't uh, uh, want to see only laws, but we want to see laws to be implemented. And this is, I think, is clear for everybody. There's always been this lag between uh, putting a law on the book and actually implementing it. I will tell sure. you a story on this. In my previous Albanian life, when the uh, Stabilization Association Agreement was under negotiation, mm -hmm. I remember an Albanian politician, I, 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 will not, I will, met, will not mention any name, but it was a politician who was telling me, okay, but uh, we have to pass uh, these 10 laws. What's the problem? 15 days, we pass everything so we can uh, progress. And the issue was, no, it's not only passing the laws, it is about implementing the laws, which is much different. Yeah. So, I think and I feel that there is full awareness of the importance of implementing uh, the right measures. Mm -hmm. let, let me ask you, because Albanians often look towards America as their number one international partner or yeah. protector or, or uh, ally now that Albania is in NATO. Can you tell us how Brussels and Washington coordinate their policies towards Albania? Are you in sync? Do you have the same objectives? Do you have the same programs, the same strategy? How, how would you describe that relationship vis-a-vis -vis Albania? Thank you for this question. I, I, uh, I will respond two ways. First of all, let me say that uh, um, there is a wonderful cooperation with the US ambassador. Um, both at the personal level and also professional level. Ambassador Visu is one of the strongest allies, if not the stronger ally I have, uh, for promoting European integration. Um, he's a personal friend, he's a great uh, professional. He has clearly understood how important is this process for the country, first of all, and also for us as uh, partners. Um, Ambassador Visu, and I'm very happy for that, speaks about European integration probably almost more than I do. And this is extremely important for me. Uh, which brings me to the following step, which is we have uh, a strong unity of intent in that. Unity of intent, that means that uh, uh, we are both convinced that uh, the path to European Union is a path of uh, stability and prosperity for Albania. Uh, is a path of uh, political growth and economic growth. So it is a path for uh, improving the country and the situation and basically the life of uh, Albanians. Uh, I would probably disclose a small secret. Um, in a meeting uh, of, um, which took place uh, some time ago at the capital level, the cooperation between the EU and the US in um, Tirana was considered as a success story in all the Balkans. So basically an example to be followed. But this is I think is, is, is rather obvious. We do not only share the same uh, values, we do not only share the same interest, but we share the same conviction, that uh, uh, the same unity of intent, that the integration of Albania is a positive, is very positive for the country, for the region, and for the partners. So for Albania, it's not a question of choice, US or EU. US, US will always be an ally within NATO, the EU is the club that we really should aspire to be a part of because we're European. I think it is not a question of choice. Mm -hmm. It is a question of uh, life. It's a question mm -hmm. of interest. It's a question, it's an obvious question. Mm -hmm. And again, 
we are very much, with Ambassador Viso, very much on the same tune on almost everything. We consult very often. He's a, he's a very wise ambassador, he's a wonderful professional. I ask him advice, number of things. We exchange views, uh, if not daily, but almost. And we act uh, in great synthony, on the, we are on the same tune on many things. And I hope, mm -hmm. I think and I hope this is perceived also outside. I hope he's watching the show, you probably get a call to I'm come sure. out for a drink I'm, later. I'm yeah. sure, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> we will break briefly for, for some adverts and be back with Ambassador Sequi in a moment. Let me stretch a little bit to some other countries that, that are active, not just so much in Albania, but in, in a sort of region-wide basis. Turkey and Russia, how, how, would you, how would you characterize their approach to this region? Does it help the EU? Does it hinder the EU? Is it, is it supplementary to the EU process? How, how would you look, particularly at Turkey? Turkey, as you know, has been a, a candidate for many years for the European Union doesn't seem to have made a lot of progress towards, towards entry, despite the time. Uh, does it contribute to the Europeanization process, would you say, in this region, in the West Balkans? Or is it presenting some sort of alternative to the European process? It's a question I've sometimes asked about this mm. neo-Ottomanism policy, which I personally tend to think is exaggerated. But what are your views? About Turkey, I, I had the chance to have, uh, in the past, not recently, two chats with the uh, Turkish foreign minister. One was in Kabul, mm -hmm. and the other one was in uh, Istanbul. And I'm very much impressed by his personality. Uh, I think uh, it is not about uh, uh, different uh, models or alternatives. Uh, personally, I believe that uh, uh, the choice of uh, Albania to progressing into the European path is absolutely clear. And I, frankly speaking, I wouldn't see any kind of uh, competition or whatever. On the opposite, I think that uh, uh, experiences of those who have already uh, started the process of negotiation could be even useful for those who have not started yet. Uh, and broadly speaking, uh, I believe that uh, uh, we all share the same values and the same interests in terms of stability of the country, mm -hmm. uh, which, is, uh, which is extremely important. I, I followed the region and also the country uh, uh, even before arriving to Albania in the beginning of 2000. Because I, I remember I was in New York uh, <clears throat> in uh, 1997 when the Security Council approved uh, the resolution for, uh, sending the, for authorizing the ALBA mission mm -hmm. to come to Albania in a very difficult moment. I was in Rome. Following the collapse of the pyramids. For, uh, precisely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was um, a, a resolution approved in 18 hours, which was a record, also because it was uh, Friday. Well, Friday in Easter 97. Um, I was in Rome and I dealt personally with uh, the first visit of uh, Mr. Tachi there. I met him recently and we rem remember that uh, non-official visit. I, I also took care of uh, the uh, arrival, I would say in Rome of Mr. Of Mr. Rugova. I, I even remember a story that in the uh, confusion of his departure, one of the children of Mr. Rugova lost a shoe and we went together, I mean, with, not with him, but with somebody who accompanied mm -hmm. to, to buy a new pair of shoes for the... And following that, I, I served in Albania starting from 2000. So I followed rather closely the region and the country in particular. And what if I learned a lesson? This lesson is that it is in the interest of everybody, this part of the world and this country, to be stable. So 
coming back to your question. I trust and I know that uh, this is an interest which is uh, rather common. It is, uh, it is on which it is necessary and it's possible to build. Well, the, let, let me follow up on the Turkish question because part of the perception, I'm looking at it from the United States, is the, the main reason Turkey isn't going into the European Union anytime soon is because it's a Muslim country. The perception also is that Albania is a Muslim country, which isn't quite true because then you're hmm. somehow interposing politics with, with religion. Uh, why not call France a Christian country or, you know, that there isn't... Yeah. In, in other words, you, you're, you're extrapolating from the, the nominal beliefs of the majority of the population to defining a country as, as being of a particular religion. But if that is the way it's perceived in some, East, some of the European Union countries, would that somehow obstruct Albania's progress? No. I think that um, <clears throat> the richness of Albania is this culture of uh, tolerance, of uh, coexistence. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think, is extremely important. This is an asset. Uh, I don't see how this uh, argument could obstruct, because I really don't see any argument in that going in that direction. Uh, believe me, what is important for us, for every single member of the club, is for Albania to be uh, willing to uh, address the integration with a due uh, commitment, which I think is there, mm -hmm. to address a number of issues related to corruption, rule of law, judiciary, and so on. This is important. Yeah. Now, I wanted to get that on the table because I'm sure that will be asked by some if there is a delay in the process of accession, yeah. but uh, it's not really a factor. If there is a delay, and that let's touch wood, mm -hmm. uh, it would be for other reasons. Right. But I trust that there would be no delay right. provided. Well, so. let me turn to another topic, um, <coughs> which is, I think, in Washington, where I work, it, it, it does preoccupy a lot of people, increasingly so. And that's the future of the European Union itself. Yeah. Um, will the European Union, basic question, will the European Union survive in the current form it has before all the Western Balkan countries are included? Or will there be what we now hear is potentially several tiers of U European Union countries with different links with each other, but a sort of set, not exactly division of the European Union, but a separation to blocks, maybe you mm. could say, within the Union. Do, I, I, know, I know you're looking more at the region here, but as a Europeanist, as a, as a diplomat for so many years that you've witnessed that not just the birth, the growth of the European Union yeah. and the deepening of the European Union. How do you see its future? I assume you are referring also to the financial crisis. The sovereign debt crisis as well, all these things that impinge mm. upon European unity. Uh, clearly, we are living in a, in a difficult time. Uh, there is a, a saying in Europe which is, never lose a good crisis. That means, uh, the history of the European Union is based on uh, crisis, is based on uh, uh, periods which are more difficult and then the uh, situation gets better. Uh, we had several crises uh, in the 70s and the 80s, uh, the oil shock for example is a big uh, challenge. We had, for example, uh, 2005, uh, the problem with the European Constitution. We had a number of problems. Mm -hmm. I don't believe, frankly, that uh, uh, the scenario that you depicted will be a realistic one. Uh, in the end, uh, what also this crisis has shown, it is the importance of what is one of the basic values of the, of the Union, which is solidarity. I will put it in a different way, also referring to the case of Albania. Mm -hmm. Let's consider, for example, the impact, the potential impact of this crisis on Albania in case uh, we had not the safety network of Europe. Because clearly the economy of Albania is very closely interconnected with the economy of some member states, in particular, which are 
um, affected by the crisis. So let's imagine for a moment the impact would have been uh, much stronger. The fact that building on that uh, solidarity I was referring to, building on the safety network that is offered by the uh, Eurozone, we are talking about Euro crisis, but we are talking about uh, not crisis of Europe, but crisis due to other reasons that we can discuss might be that. But thanks to the safety network ensured by the Eurozone, uh, also the potential impact of the crisis on Albania has been reduced. So, uh, I think that uh, this mechanism and the big interconnection which exists among all the, the states, member states, uh, does not really allow us to go in that direction. Because, uh, frankly speaking, uh, everybody would be affected or non affected. So, solidarity and interconnection, I think, are two key words in order to conclude that that scenario is not possible. But again, this is my view. Mm -hmm. Oscar Wilde would say, this is my opinion and I share it. But I strongly share it. Right. Well, I mean, Albania looks obviously south towards Greece and the, 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 the huge sovereign debt crisis and the repercussions <laughs> of that mm. for the Greek economy, for austerity. I know recent figures, a lot of Greeks, young people leaving the country, um, trying to get work outside. It's a very tragic situation. But uh, looking at that from a country that wants to come into the European Union, what would be the message to that country? In other words, can you guarantee or can you convince people that we're not going to become another Greece in the future? And again, could you convince people that uh, uh, the fact that not being member or engaged in the right direction towards Europe could be better? I don't see really that. Mm -hmm. And I can offer and I try to offer solid reasons mm -hmm. to go in the, the opposite direction. <laughs> Basically, uh, mm -hmm. Greece has experienced a solidarity by other, as other countries. Uh, this is critical because uh, this, to me, is the best and the more, most eloquent uh, um, proof that, again, it is even in the interest of Albania to go, I mean, to join the club. Solidarity. And, uh, and uh, I think... It's better uh, to have friends when you're in crisis. Thank you, brother. It's better to have friends when you're in crisis. Absolutely. It is better. Mm -hmm. It is good to have friends also when you're not in crisis, but in particular when you're mm -hmm. in crisis. Well, let me ask you about your country, Italy. Albania has always looked towards Italy in a way as a gateway towards Europe, yeah. as an example, as a model. Just about every Albanian I know speaks Italian. <laughs> um, the, the problems Italy is currently, exp currently experiencing, of course, are not at the level of Greece. I was looking at some statistics recently in terms of the now projected uh, GDP contraction, um, slowdown in, you know, in economic growth, uh, budgetary problems that Rome has. Can you, again, as we were saying a few minutes ago, can you explain to the Albanian audience why it's beneficial for Italy, if even undergoing that crisis, to be within the Union and to, uh, to be outside the Union? Okay, uh, let me first say that, uh, <clears throat> technically speaking, uh, I'm not Italian in this moment, and because <laughs> and as, uh, I represent the Union, European. As, yeah. as such, mm -hmm. I would not be uh, in a position to comment on uh, mm -hmm. individual member states. Nevertheless, let me take out this hat for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think that uh, the example of Italy is very interesting. First of all, there is this unity of intent, this national objective to get out of the crisis, which uh, puts together I would say, all the uh, political forces of the uh, Italian spectrum. Mm -hmm. This, I think, is a very good, uh, um, uh, very good message. Uh, secondly, so I, I think that what, uh, uh, what we said about solidarity is the proof, because uh, it is a fact that uh, uh, a kind of coordinated number of actions were undertaken uh, in order to, uh, so to say, uh, preserve the stability 
the economic stability in Italy. And this was done in close coordination with uh, uh, all the other partners, with their solidarity. So I think in itself, these two examples should mean a lot. I wouldn't go further because, mm -hmm. again, I would like to rehat me again as a European. <laughs> I understand. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, there is also another, another similarity. Uh, uh, Italy is a, a founding member of the Union. Right. <coughs> and uh, uh, the popularity of the Union, so the Europeanism, of Italians is very high. Mm -hmm. uh, there I see uh, a further message because if it is so high even in times of crisis then the perception that it is at the end of the day a national interest to, mm. to be still members and to be uh, supportive mm. of the Union, well this, this must be a reason. Mm. It's a very good point because even in a country like Greece, which is undergoing much tougher times than any other European Union country, the support for the EU membership remains. So I think this is a very eloquent message also to Albania. Let me ask a very last question. Unfortunately, we always run out of time. I only have an hour. In terms of identity, and I've heard this from some Central Europeans, some East Europeans, some politicians use this to their advantage, that somehow when you become part of the European Union, you lose some of your national identity. You lose your distinctiveness, your, your, some of your traditions, culture, religion, whatever it is. And I've heard this, as I said, in some Central European countries. What would be your message to Albanians? Are they going to lose their identity in this no. sort of European mix? No. Uh, and, I, and I would uh, offer two arguments. As I said before, one of the uh, slogans, or rather, or the, or this, the, yeah, let's call it a slogan, a mantra in Europe is united in diversity, because we recognize that we, there is a diversity, but this is a richness in itself. And this is accepted, and this is really, we, 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 we are uh, able, we were able, we are able, and we are willing to build on our diversities, because it enriches us. Uh, much more. The second is this. The second reason is, is, is very clear. I, uh, something that I appreciate a lot in Albania is in particular Albanian youth, youngsters. I am fully convinced that uh, an injection of the vitality that I see in Albania would be very much beneficial to Europe. Um, here you can see uh, youngsters who are uh, curious, who ask questions, who are, uh, speak two languages, at least learn by themselves, who are able to, to face whatever sacrifice in order, for example, to study, to progress, to travel, to know new things. This is a, a vibrant, uh, this is a vibrant uh, youth, a vital one, which would very beneficially influence also, I think, uh, uh, our countries in Europe. But this is based also on uh, 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 bringing to the club what are the experiences, the mm -hmm. values, the enthusiasm of this country, which is very vibrant. So I think uh, there is no point in losing identity, but rather on offering this identity to enrich and fortify the common building. And of course, Albanians have a very strong sense of tradition and identity, which I don't think Europe would ever be able to, to dissipate. <laughs> Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for a very stimulating and informative interview. Uh, and above all, thank you for your commitment to Albania. Uh, it's, it's good to see that people such as yourself from the European Union understand Albania, understand its problems, but also are optimistic, I would say. You're realistic, but I would say you're also optimistic about it. Forward-looking. Forward-looking. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you.
My second commentary on a major regional topic this evening focuses on Serbia's election calculations. Serbia's decision to hold presidential, parliamentary and local elections on the 6th of May impacts directly on several of its neighbours, especially on the stability of Kosovo. The impending election campaign will bring to the forefront many of the regional ambitions and calculations in Belgrade's foreign policy. In trying to secure public support for his Democratic Party-led coalition, President Boris Tadic is trying to balance Europeanism with nationalism. For example, the recent deal with Pristina concerning Kosovo's participation in regional initiatives was largely a tactical maneuver intended to achieve EU candidate status. European Union candidacy enables the Serbian government to demonstrate its foreign policy successes before the national elections, even though there will be no immediate material benefits and no hastened European integration. The government in Belgrade also seeks to appeal to Serbia's national constituency and to draw votes away from the Progressive Party and other more vocal nationalists. Leaders of the governing coalition will pose as the more rational nationalists who have managed to combine EU prospects with the non-recognition of Kosovo. As Belgrade does not need anything more from Pristina at this juncture, the election atmosphere will become tense between the two capitals. Tadic can always return to the negotiating table after the elections if he wants to appease Brussels or gain some concrete benefits from the European Union. In a provocative act designed to gain the nationalist vote, Belgrade has decided to include Kosovo in Serbia's local elections. Balloting will be scheduled in three northern municipalities where Serbs are seeking partition. Belgrade's moves have drawn criticism from several EU countries, including France and Germany, who assert that this violates Kosovo's territorial integrity. However, the European Union is unlikely to impose any sanctions on Serbia as many capitals are fearful that this will simply inflate the nationalist vote. Belgrade's election decision has also heightened the risk of clashes in Kosovo itself and will be a major test for Prime Minister Hashim Tachi. He has asserted that the government will not allow Belgrade to organize polls in the country, but he has not specified what measures could be used to stop them. Tachi's credibility has been battered since the signing of the so-called footnote agreement with Serbia that dropped the word Republic from Kosovo's name for it to participate in regional meetings in which Serbia also participates. In a recent public opinion poll, 64% of Kosovars were actually against the agreement. Belgrade's ability to stage local elections anywhere in Kosovo will further embolden the political opposition against Tachi and increase nationalist sentiments. This could lead to clashes in northern Kosovo as Albanian activists may seek to prevent elections from taking place. Belgrade could actually welcome such a scenario because its objective is to destabilize Kosovo and claim that it is unviable as an independent state. Let me turn now to our studio audience for questions and answers about politics and world affairs. What is on the minds of Albanian citizens? Today we have students and professors from Epoca University in Tirana. Welcome to the show. Let me get a bit closer to you. And please, who is first? Okay, okay I am going to ask the first questions. I would like to introduce myself before asking the questions. My name is Dr. Bekir Chinar. I'm a lecturer at Epoca University, and also I am the director of the Center for European Studies. My question comes from the uh, research which Center recently published, and there are, uh, it is about the public perceptions of Albania towards various issues. One of the questions we asked the public, then, which is the, how do you think about the unification of Albanians in these regions? And something around more than 70% of the pe people want Albanian unifications. My question is very simple. A, and we define the democracy 
for people by people. So therefore, the majority of the people want unifications. If this is the case, do you think that European Union is going to stand in front of the disunifications in order to achieve the peace and prosperity in the regions, or will encourage the unification of Albanians and for the same reason, for peace and prosperity on the region? Thank you very much. OK. Well, let me start with, with this position. What, what do you mean by reunification? You know, unification, the way it's understood in Europe, is within the European Union. In other words, there are certain states and certain borders that are now accepted as permanent. In other words, countries that have been recognized when Yugoslavia collapsed uh, in the 1990s that have become independent. And nobody questions their territorial integrity, their independence, their sovereignty. The only way I would say for the, Euro for the Albanian community to be able to unite is through the process of Europeanization. In other words, the European Union process, where borders become less than important, where economic activity increases, where cultural and other forms of contact also increase. In other words, the, all these processes, this is the, the theory, but hopefully also the practice, will prevent, let's say, certain elements of the population to push for dissolution of a country or partition of a country. Because once this process were to happen now in the Balkans, and it's beginning to happen with the potential drive by Serbs to partition Kosovo, we don't know the final outcome and the instability that will result from it, but also how Albania and other countries will be then obstructed from joining the European Union. My answer would be very simple. There are states that are accepted as territory, territorially integral, as members of the United Nations and or other organizations, and their territorial integrity will not be questioned because of the aspirations of a particular population within those countries. The best way for Albanians to reunite is to focus on getting their country to be a model of of a model aspirant to enter the European Union. And that depends not only on the political elite, but it also depends on the population. In other words, you don't see that Albanians who live in Albania and the Kosovo, Macedonia, their unification can be dream, can be reality. In the short, mid-term, I don't see any possibility of that. In 20, 30, 40, 50 years, who knows how the European Union will look. Hopefully, borders will become irrelevant. So whether you're in Kosovo or Albania or Serbia or Macedonia won't make much difference. It will be part of one whole, one political unit, an economic unit. Please, who's next? Mr. Bugajski, uh, what do you think are the factors that generated the recent ethnic tensions in Macedonia? And uh, what are your predictions and recommendations regarding a possible solution to the newly emerged conflicts in the Balkans, especially in Macedonia and Kosovo? I spent uh, a few days in Macedonia and Skopje a few weeks ago, and I go to Pristina quite regularly as well. It's two very distinct situations, two very distinct potentials for conflict. Macedonia, I think, has a huge problem. As you know, it is blocked from entry into both NATO and the European Union because of this ongoing name dispute with Athens, with Greece. As a result, I do believe that large parts of the population, particularly the Albanian population, is getting frustrated. Frustrated with the stalemate, with the gridlock, with the lack of progress towards NATO where Albanians want to belong, and European Union where they also want to belong. In addition, I think uh, the policy of the Macedonian government has been overly nationalistic, stressing the heritage of the Macedonians, uh, uh, spending uh, enormous amounts of resources on this Renaissance 2014 campaign, which has alienated a lot of Albanians. Albanians also have seen a slowdown in progress in implementing the Ohrid Agreement, which I think has, has, has fueled dissatisfaction with the government, has fueled tensions in Macedonia, and on the other side, the Slavic Macedonians view the Albani what the Albanians achieved through Ohrid as being detri detrimental to them. In other words, they see it as a, a, a zero-sum game. If you, if you gain, we lose, which is actually the wrong approach, because Albanians deserve to be represented in state and other institutions according to the population. But you now have a situation which is very unclear, 
uh, it seems to me that, some, to, to directly answer your question, somebody is trying to provoke a conflict in the country. I'm not sure who. I don't think anybody does. Whether it's a small group of, of Albanian guerrillas, uh, whether it's some nationalists on the Macedonian side, or maybe it's some outside powers in collusion with some local forces. We don't know. But the tragedy is that innocent, unarmed people are suffering. Whether it's students on buses in Skopje, whether it's uh, fishermen uh, on the lake outside of Skopje, and, and who knows what's next. I think it's incumbent on the Macedonian government, together with the Albanian leadership, to really lean on the population. Do not be provoked because this is a provocation to try and unsettle this country and bring about conflict. And I think that sort of conflict would reverberate negatively on Albania. It could, if it spirals out of control, affect your progress, Albania's progress, towards European Union and a closer relationship with both the United States and Brussels. Kosovo, you also mentioned the situation is a little bit different. You have a minority in the north that doesn't recognize the government uh, in Pristina. That, I think, is the core of the problem, uh, because that is used then by Belgrade to disqualify uh, Kosovo as a state, as an independent, sovereign country. And that itself generates internal problems for the Kosovars, because you now have increasing protests against what is seen as insufficient policy by both Pristina, but also by NATO and the EU in unifying the country. And the biggest provocation at the moment are the elections, because the local elections which it's fine to have local elections, but not local elections in your country for another country. This is the problem, that behind these elections lurks an agenda of partition, of separation, which won't be accepted, certainly not by Washington, hopefully not by the European Union, but it could also engender conflicts within Kosovo. And the attention then will not be on state building so much and reform, but on conflict with this minority. And that, I think, would be a huge problem for Kosovo. Please, who's next? Dea Dima, Epoca University. According to you, Mr. Bugajski, should people in the countries that aspire in the European membership, such as Albania, should focus more primarily in their moral behavior and in their social integrity, rather than accusing the politicians for the membership delay? It's a very good question, because ultimately, politicians are responsible for the country but that the country is responsible for the politicians. In other words, you elected people that are supposed to represent you and are supposed to fulfill your ambitions, your aspirations. So it's a two-way relationship. A politician ultimately is a servant of the people. You don't go into politics to make money. As I've said before, you, you make money after you leave politics. You don't go into politics to be in conflict. You enter politics to find ways of compromising in order to further basic national interests. So Albanians have to hold their country, their, their politicians in the country accountable to their aspirations. But it's also incumbent for civic society, for the media, for other independent sectors, non-governmental sectors of society, to express their views, not only about Europe, but also about their politicians and to press them to fulfill the reasons why they were voted. Why would you vote, for example, for a politician? Because he offered hope of European Union membership, of a good, close relationship with the United States. You didn't vote for them out of partisan interests. You voted for your country. Similarly, the politician has to behave for the interests of his or her country. Lindiana Galetti, studying at Epoca University. It seems that Western countries have recently emphasized issues on sexual orientation in Albania. Yet Albania has more big and important problem, problem like integration of minorities, blood feuds, uh, poverty, corruption and the like. What is the reason of this bias? Sexual orientation, lifestyle is a very important question because it's an individual choice. If we believe in freedom of choice, if we believe in freedom of, of life, as long as it doesn't interfere with somebody else, that freedom should be allowed. There are three basic freedoms, I think. National freedom, ethnic freedom, and your private personal freedom. 
And private personal freedom includes your sexual orientation. It's a major human rights issue that's important for the European Union, it's important in the United States. And I think the idea is for us to bring Albania, together with all the other countries in the region, closer to European standards of tolerance, of acceptance of diversity, and acceptance of privacy. That is, I think, essential. Your private life is your business, nobody else's. And the state or other parties should not interfere with that. Please. My name is Artim Bor, uh, student at Puga University. My question is very simple and very important also. How soon do you think that Albania can join EU? If I could have a crystal ball and forecast, but unfortunately I cannot. It depends on the government, it depends on the population, it depends on the reforms Albania is able to conduct and how quickly it can conduct them. Uh, let me give you an example. Countries such as Poland or Czech Republic or Hungary, they didn't automatically enter the European Union. They had very stringent uh, agenda and, and criteria that they had to meet in order to gain membership. And it took a long time. It may take longer here because you had a lower starting point. You know, where Albania was, you think about it 20 years ago, I don't think it would have qualified for any organization 20 years ago. You're already in NATO, you've made great progress towards the European Union, but I think it's incumbent on the population, not just the leadership, to push their politicians to pass the legislation, to implement the legislation, and to make sure that all the criteria are met for EU membership. As I keep saying, you don't negotiate your way into the European Union. You qualify for the European Union. You have to make yourself an attractive partner for the European Union. How long it will take? I would say within, certainly within your generation, hopefully within my generation. Uh, Croatia, it took, you know, since the breakup of Yugoslavia, it took them, what, 20-something uh, years. They will enter next year. I don't think you should look simply at timetables, though. I think more important is to meet the criteria. And if you think of the fast progress Albania has made in terms of its economy, in terms of its social progress, political progress, I think it can, be, it can be faster. But you have to keep, as we say, the, the politicians feed to the fire to make sure they deliver. Please. Good evening. I am Emery Nahuti, second year student of political science and international relations. My question is, in the light of acquittals by the Albanian courts, uh, considering the cases of Maid Anger Deity, what's your opinion for the effectiveness of uh, our judicial system? The effectiveness of the judicial system will be summarized, I think, in the European Commission report later this year. I'm not privy to all the, uh, let's say, inside information about how courts uh, function. But I would state a basic principle. There should be no political interference with the judicial process. No politician should have immunity, because immunity means impunity. Every politician has to separate themselves from any kind of business contracts that can affect either their personal aggrandizement or the loss to the state. Let me sort of stop at that because I think one needs to look very closely in, in the bigger picture. The more the, independent, uh, the, the more the judiciary becomes independent of any kind of political interference, the better for the country. But that is a long-term process. There are several countries that are already in the European Union and I'll mention Romania and Bulgaria as too, where there is still a certain degree of political interference, lack of complete judicial uh, freedom, judicial independence. If Albania can make faster progress than some of the countries within the European Union, then I think it would be a huge bonus. And it's a long-term process, because there's a certain, it's not just institutional question, it's a cultural question, it's a personal question. But the basic principle is politics has to be separated from the judicial process. These are two very separate things. Thank you. Please, anybody Kjotem else? Brata from Epoca University. Well, my question is a short one, but I guess not less important. Uh, what do you think about the status uh, of journalistic uh, freedom and independence in Albania? Well, I'm very free and independent <laughs> here at Albanian Screen. Uh, I can't speak for every single journalist. Uh, there are reports that certain journalists are under pressure, and I don't know if it's necessarily political pressure. It's more job pressure. You know, it's, it's a market where uh, what we used to call in Central Eastern Europe self-censorship. You tend to do the things that your editors expect or certain politicians may expect. 
I'm not talking about Albania necessarily, but, but the wider region. It's vital for a, for a country to make progress, not only towards the European Union, but at its own standards. It has to have full freedom of information. It has to have journalistic freedom to ans ask and answer every question, to write about whatever they want, and as with me, to speak whatever I want. That is vital for, Al for Albania and for any country that wants to qualify uh, for the European Union and to better its own environment. Because ultimately, if you speak freely, you feel freer, you act more liberally, and you're able to perform better. Without, with restrictions on information or speech, I think the whole country suffers. Yes, Please. my name is Suila Jana, a student of Epoca University, the Department of Political Science and International Relation. My question is, uh, do you think that uh, now Albania is ready to have a, a president, uh, as a president, uh, a female? And uh, would this thing affect in the Albanian integration? I don't know if it will help in integration, but it will certainly help in the image of Albania as being, you know, there's one image of Albania as a very patriarchal country, not just Albania, but certain countries uh, from, from the Balkans. If Albania was to to vote for the parliament to, to vote in a president who was female, that would certainly help in the perceptions that this is a gender uh, equal society or that progress is being made on gender equality, which is an extremely important aspect, I would say, of, of uh, social development. But the choice should ultimately be based on merit. You know, there should be, of course, more women candidates. And I would say this not just for Albania, but for every country. But it's incumbent on people like you to become more involved in politics. You know, politics isn't just out there, it's your daily life, it's bettering your community, it's helping your family, helping your nation. And women have as much to offer, and sometimes more to offer, I would say, than men. So the more women that are involved in politics, the better. And sooner or later, yes, Albania will have a woman president and a woman prime minister as well. Maybe at the same time. Please. Deron Gassinche, student of Epoca University, second year. I would like to know or to ask you about uh, the situation if there the Albanian state inside its administrative border line would be membership of the European Union before the region. I mean, if the Albanian living in the national border line, not in the administrative border line, will remain outside Albania. Will there be problem or conflict or will this generate more problems in the region? I don't think the region will be taken in as a whole. There won't be a sort of simultaneous package of inclusion because every country is being judged on its own standards, on its merit, on its progress, on its reforms. Um, you know, you have to go through certain stages, candidacy and you know, accession, actual accession process, which then has to be ratified by every government in the European Union and so forth. And, you know, for Croatia, it took a long time. Next year, they're going to be a member. Whether it will affect uh, minorities or Albanian population, should I say, in neighboring states, I think it will affect them in a positive way. For example, even if uh, Montenegro, for example, gets into the European Union, and they may well be the next, uh, small country, small is beautiful, sometimes it works quicker. Um, how will that affect Albania? I think it will encourage Albania to look at Montenegro, to, 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 to try and follow this, this, this progression that they've made towards the European Union and try and follow suit. And similarly, there'll be a knock-on effect in other countries. Maybe what you're asking is whether it will close borders. I don't think so, because that visa liberalization program now applies to all the countries in the region. And there's still several steps, even after accession, that Albania would need to take to be part of the Schengen zone. So the freedom of movement question will come later. So my answer would be, hopefully, it will be a positive model, a positive example for other countries. The one problem I fear, and I, I mentioned this earlier, is if Macedonia is, is blocked indefinitely, in other words, that despite making progress in terms of its reforms, in terms of its legislation, it still can't go in because of a dispute with Greece over its name. That could present more of a problem, I think, to the Albanian population within Macedonia. And secondly, if Kosovo is blocked from the European Union because of the fact that not all European Union countries recognize Kosovo's independence, that will also be a problem. 
not just for Kosovo, but also for Albania, but also for the European Union. We've already come to the end of the show. Uh, thank you very much for all of you for being here. Uh, I enjoyed your questions. Hopefully you enjoyed my answers. And uh, I'll be back very soon. Good luck in your work. Thank you to my friends and colleagues at Albanian Screen for making this possible. And uh, we've come to the, as I said, we've come to the end of the show. I have greatly enjoyed, as always, to be with you all. Uh, good night, everyone. Stay healthy, be productive, and most of all, remain optimistic. See you soon. Miro Pavshin.